Never before in all my years as a priest have I received so many telephone calls and emails and text messages from people, even around the world, expressing depression and stress that they are experiencing during this pandemic lockdown. People have lost their jobs, have lost their homes, their apartments. Cities are many times laid in ruin. The closure, permanent closure even of restaurants that have been around for, I heard one restaurant closed down after 63 years in service because they can't get through this coronavirus financially. And so people are even feeling rather suicidal, like why, is, why should I even bother to try to live? I can't deal with this. It's during times like this that we need to remember that God is closer to us than our own breath. And that we humans have gone through periods like this before. My heart goes out to all of you. And I pray for all of the Orthodox bishops of the world and the priests of parishes who have the heavy burden of making decisions that sometimes are ridiculed by their people. And yet they feel they have to make decisions to keep churches closed or people distanced. I'm not going to pretend to know why all of this is happening, or even if it's real. I can only say that what is coming down is God allowed for our salvation. This pandemic is a call to all of us, even a wake-up call, that we need to repent both as individuals and as a society and as nations even. I understand the despair that many of you are suffering. As a young man of about 24, and I was between college and graduate school and I was lost and I felt I had no hope for my future, I had no plans, my neediness was even separating some of my friends from me. They didn't want to deal with my neediness. And finally, in absolute despair, I caught a bus and drove from Berkeley to San Francisco. And I went to the Golden Gate Bridge with the intent of committing suicide. I stopped at a phone booth to call my therapist to let him know that I wanted him to please tell my parents that it wasn't their fault because I couldn't bear the thought of my parents blaming themselves. Ultimately, they would have anyway. But I asked him to please make it clear to them that I was not, that I had not committed suicide because of them. I just couldn't live with myself anymore and with my circumstances. My therapist had enough sense to figure out I must be at the Golden Gate Bridge since so many people jump from that bridge every year that live in the Bay Area. So he wrote a note to his secretary asking her to call the bridge authority. And by the time I was ending the call and was about to walk out of the booth, I saw two state patrolmen heading my way. Before I could even get out, they had me and they were escorting me to a small state patrol office at the end of the bridge. And then one of them made a telephone call to a local hospital, letting them know that they were going to be transporting me there to their psychiatric unit. And I, in my mind, I freaked out and I thought, I'm not going to that unit. I'm going to the end of the bridge. I'm going to go jump. But I smiled and joked with them and tried to make them believe that none of this was really serious and that I'm just fine. I'm going to be just fine. 
So as they were walking me towards the patrol car, I took off running. I was a long distance runner at the time and I left them in the dust. And I was about a quarter of the way out onto the bridge and I looked around at them to see where they were. And they were way behind me and I was clearly gonna be able to meet the goal of getting to the center of the bridge and leaping over the rail to my death. But at that moment, a small vehicle was traveling past me on the left. And as I turned around, looking straight forward, I saw a patrolman jump off of that little vehicle and tackle me. And all three of them handcuffed me and walked me back to the patrol car. When I arrived at the psychiatric unit, there was no way I was going to suffer that madness. So I asked a friend to please bring me some clothes and I put on a sport coat and a, and a tie and I had a tablet and I was writing poetry and I was sitting in the rec room of the psychiatric unit and all of the daytime staff saw me and assumed that I was a graduate student. So they let me be. On the third day, the psychiatrist that was in charge of the unit came to talk to them about the various patients there. And he went down the list and then he got to me and he said, how's he been doing? And they said, well, who are you talking about? We don't know who he is. And he pointed to me, he said, he's that fellow over there with a sport coat. Well, then he found out that they all thought that I was a graduate student and boy, was he furious. And boy, did some of the staff take it out on me. So I finally had to consent to go through the group therapy and get through it so that I could get out of there. So the 28th day I was released. But the experience sobered me. And then I decided that I wanted to help other young men who were facing what I had been facing with depression and feelings of lack of self-worth. So together with a friend, I formed the Men's Resource Center as a drop-in rap group place and to help other young guys like me deal with life which ultimately led me into graduate school and I became a therapist myself. Now that was 40 years ago that I left that profession and became a monk. I share all of this with you because I look at that experience now as accepted by God because God was wanting me to be there in service to other people. And that's what I am now. I am now you know, I'm in the hospital, I'm working in the hospital of the soul, which is the church. And as a priest, I'm now the therapist within this institution. I look back at my youth and my former life, and I can't believe it. It was even me. I'm happy. I live in a beautiful monastery on a beautiful island with brother monks that I love and who love me. I get to serve the divine liturgy for visitors and pilgrims. I have the privilege of hearing confessions and helping people get through life and feel better about themselves. So all of you who are suffering right now, and there are so many of you, I want you to know that there is hope, that the Holy Virgin is cupping you in her hands and that the Lord Jesus is there beckoning you to himself and that this pandemic will end. Our life will maybe not be the same as it was before, but with God's help, it will be better. And we will have learned the importance of putting God first and letting our life be what God meant it to be. And 
regardless of what is happening in our world, to look forward to the world to come with life everlasting. So I impart these words to you with love, much love. I want all of you to know that I care about you and that I pray for all of you daily. And that one day we will all be standing before the throne of God, worshiping before the Holy Trinity, together with all the saints that have gone on before us and with the heavenly hosts. And then we will look back at the trials that we've had in this life with gratitude, that it was a learning experience and it called our attention to the reality that God loves us and that nothing happens, even the bad things, that is not salvific. Amen. <laughs>